Hallelujah. Holy Jesus, great Father God, precious Holy Spirit, we pray that we have treaded softly in your presence, that we have not bulldozed our way into this sacred moment with anything on our minds or hearts except you and your goodness, your greatness, your holiness. Lord, you want all of my mind, my heart, my body. And I pray that as we stand here now, we will offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Help us clear our hearts and minds of everything except this moment because this choir just sang under the anointing, speak, Lord, speak. And I pray that what is spoken will be heard. I am convinced, Lord Jesus, by your Spirit, that the end of all things is upon us. We are in the closing moments of time. We are about to be caught away in the clouds of glory. And you are giving us this opportunity in 2020 to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit and perfect holiness in the fear of God. Lord, we recognize that this should have been a time of brokenness, of searching and seeking for the depths of Christ. Oh God, I pray now for that heavenly unction that would be so real that people do not see a man but they hear the voice of God. I pray for revival in the church. I pray that the remnant will draw closer and weep more and rejoice greatly. I pray for those on the fringe to get a hold of themselves and realize the time is at hand. Behold, you are coming quickly. And I ask you to let me preach as though this is my last message. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And all of God's rapture-ready people said amen. amen. Read with me Hebrews chapter 2. Verses 1 through 4. Hallelujah. You know, I just thank God for what I feel today. A lot of people say it's got nothing to do with feelings. I beg to differ with you. There are times I don't feel it, and it's real. But there are times I feel it, and I thank God that I feel it. The Lord God is in this place today. Hallelujah. And I pray that he's in your room right where you're sitting and watching this. I'll try to get started again. Join me. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. The Lord has spoken. Blessed be his name. You may be seated. <clears throat> Therefore, uh, which means that there was a statement before that. This is a conclusion. And that statement was that God 
has provided salvation. And he has sent angels to minister to those who are the heirs of salvation. That's you and me. Therefore, we, we must give the more earnest heed. We should be on our tiptoes listening. Our ears should be wide open. We should be cupping our hands over our spiritual ears to hear every whisper of the Holy Ghost. What is it you're saying to us today, Lord? Even though we may have read it before and heard it often, what is it that I am required to heed, but not just heed, earnestly heed, desperately listen for? Earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Isn't that an amazing warning? Lest we drift away. It's odd to me that you don't have to work at being carnal and fleshly and sinful. It's just there. But if you want to be spirit-filled, fruit-bearing, and on fire, you have to constantly heed what you've heard. Every time the Lord speaks, there should be a seriousness about it. And uh, as I've said many times, an eternalness about it that makes us take that and hold it close and protect it with all that we have. It's possible to drift away. It's possible to listen to gospel preaching all your life and it becomes common to you, and you drift away. You know, he used the term drift. Another translation says slip away, but neither of them means a flood came and washed it away, uh, nor does it mean that a disaster came and destroyed it. It said, lest we slip, lest we drift we must give them more earnest heed to the things that we have heard. Here's the reason. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and it did throughout Scripture, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, and it did and they did, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord. So what is it he's admonishing us to listen to? And what is it that, what is the subject matter that is supposed to dominate us and drive our daily living? It is our salvation. Brothers and sisters, if we neglect that, we've neglected life itself. Neglect, that means ignore it. And we are in a generation and a society that finds it increasingly easy to ignore gospel preaching, to ignore Holy Scripture, to read the Bible and not remember what we just read, to read it and not be moved to change, to not be um, urged to seek and cry out and search for God. This is the generation that can hear the Bible preached and not shed a single tear. This is the generation that has empty altars because people have a form of godliness, but they have no power in their lives. They pretend, they walk as Christians, but their lives do not bear out the fact that they have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it becomes easy to ignore and neglect our salvation. Now, when you get into a spiritual state, you wonder why in God's holy name, when you're in revival mode, you wonder, why do I ever ignore this? How can I go a day without walking with Jesus? What is it about life that lures me away from him so that I can actually go a week 
without reading and praying until I touch the hem of his garment. What is it about my uh, tendency, my proclivity to slip away and to backslide and have to be reminded over and over? What is it about this world and my flesh that always wants to move away from the one who loved me and gave himself for me? This is salvation, brothers. There's no greater subject in this world to roll across the lips of human beings saved by the grace of God. Salvation from death and hell. This is what God did. And we're not to neglect it. Don't ne I beg you, church, don't neglect this great salvation. Do not take it for granted. Do not count it a common thing. Do not consider it just another matter in your life. You ought to rejoice over it. Cling to it. Run after it. Hold tightly to it. Nourish it. Feed it. Go to bed with it. Get up with it. Think about it. Ponder it. Meditate on it day and night. Saved. Saved by the grace of God. Salvation through faith in the risen Lord Jesus. The most wonderful thing that a human being can ever say is that I've been saved by the shed blood of Jesus and I'm on my way to heaven. <laughs> Salvation. See, this is what church is all about. It's not about all this foolish fluff that are, that's being preached by uh, the deceitful shepherds these days about your inner goodness and finding yourself and God wants you to have a better life. That's foolishness. No, this is about God's son, Jesus, who was born of a virgin Mary, who lived a sinless and holy life, who did not have deceit in his heart and guile in his mouth and was taken by wicked men and nailed to a cross according to God's holy plan. And when they nailed him to a cross, he hung there and God laid on him the iniquity of us all. He did not flinch. He did not cry out for deliverance. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And in hanging on that cross, he took the wrath of God, the anger of Almighty God that would have been poured out on this world. Jesus himself alone took every bit of it in his body on the tree. The Father God laid all of our iniquities upon him. And when he did, Jesus died and lifted up his head and said, into your, into your grace and into your presence I commend my spirit. And he died. And then he took that sin to hell. And then he came out on the third day and he left my sins in the pit. And when he walked out, he saved me by grace. And when I called on his name, he said, now I'm yours and you're mine. I, you're as clean as I am. You're as holy as I am. You're a child of God. I bless you into the kingdom of the son of the dear God, the living and dear God. Do you hear me? That's your salvation. Jesus didn't save you to have a better life. You can do that with a little money for a little while. You can do that when life is good. But he didn't save you to have a better life or to discover yourself. Salvation is that God saved you from hell. He saved you from wrath. And in saving you from hell and wrath, he gave you eternal life, abundant, eternal, spiritual, deep, fulfilling, promising life. Don't neglect that. Do not yawn when it is spoken or preached. Don't ever wake up another day 
and just say, I'm saved. You ought to wake up every day of your life with a praise, with a joy that no other human being can have except those who know him. This is serious, wonderful, eternal stuff. And this writer said, don't neglect this great salvation. Because if you do, how do you think you will escape? Well, then the question is begged, escape what? Escape what? How shall we escape if we neglect, ignore this great salvation? The answer is the wrath of God. It's the worst thing. Jesus died to give you the best to deliver you from the worst. It's the wrath of God. The anger of God. You cannot ignore and push aside salvation and not expect God to pay you back. We've been delivered from the wrath to come. I'm telling you, brother, if we understood the awfulness of God's wrath, and then would wake up each day and remember, we will never face it. Because he faced it for me. I will never face the wrath of God. Because his precious son who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Took it and faced it for me. The wrath of God. How shall we escape? You know, there are a number of passages in this Bible I've been studying Lately, I've been in the Old Testament quite a bit. And when I talk about the wrath of God, that is one subject that nobody wants to deal with if they want their church to grow. <clears throat> Have you noticed that? That's a subject only one out of ten TV preachers will deal with because they want to keep their viewership because everybody wants to see God as, uh, as a big old granddaddy fawning over all of us who wouldn't hurt anybody. And that's why the doctrine of hell is being eliminated from the doctrines of the church and most preachers today because this great God of love would never send anybody to flames of hell for eternity. How could that God, if he really loves people, how could he do that? And so now it's being ejected from the sermons that are in the churches, which leaves churches full of sin and sinners. That's why the altars are empty. That's why the eyes are dry. That's why there's no change, no revival in many Christians' lives today. Christians' lives. I really, the older I get and the more I pray, I wonder if they really are Christians. But, but, but as I turned over here to Genesis chapter 19, I believe it was, I would like to read something to you. This is the account of Lot. When God saw that Sodom had uh, reached the limit and God had reached his and he sent two angels down to Lot and his family and said, tell them to get out of this place. I'm going to destroy it. Am I telling the truth so far? Okay. So when the two angels get there, in the appearance of men, they're in Lot's house, and the men of Sodom, <clears throat> the homosexuals and sodomites of Sodom, banged on the door and said, send those men out to us that we may know them. That's gross homosexuality. And I've, hear, I've heard people in our ranks say the sin of Sodom was not homosexuality. It was that they were rude to visitors. And that is the typical gay response to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is utterly absurd. You see, they may have been rude 
That goes in with all the other sins. Uh, materialism, trafficking, drunkenness, idolatry. The homosexuality was just the culmination of all their sins. And so when they said, send those men out to us that we may know them, they were saying, we want to abuse them. We are free. And God said, well, this, it'll be the last time you do anything. And so making a very wonderfully beautiful and long story short, the angels finally took Lot and his family by the hands and said, get out of here. Listen, escape from this place. That's what I'm preaching about in Hebrews 2. Escape from this place. And they were so hesitant to get busy about it, they had to literally grab them and said, you better get out of here. And they said this, we cannot do anything to this city until you be gone. And there's your picture of the rapture of the church and the wrath of God. And the wrath is coming. But God's people will not suffer it. And you need to know that Lot and his daughters did not suffer some of the brimstone, half of the brimstone. No, God said, I won't even pour it out until you're gone. Thus, the Lord is saying to the church, get ready. I'm about to judge this old world. You got to escape from this place. Be done with its sins. And many of the church are just fooling around, still dilly-dallying with the world, and the Holy Spirit is trying to grab you by the hands and say, time is running out. You better get serious with God. You better get down to business with God because the judgment, the wrath of God is about to fall on this place. I believe it with all of my heart. And when Jesus was teaching about it, he said, on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, the Lord rained fire and brimstone on the city. I'm telling you, God is holding it all back right now. He's trying to give this world and this country an opportunity to wake up and realize we're headed towards a precipice. We're about to destroy ourselves. I'm telling you, God is going to pour judgment on this country. I have to mention it again because I'm not ashamed to mention it. We've killed 62 million innocent babies. We've ill-treated millions of people. There are people in prisons all over this country who don't deserve to be there. And I'm telling you, God has reached the limit. And if ever I've tried to warn a church, I'm doing it now. The trumpet is going to sound soon. It could sound today. You better not be tangled up in Sodom. You not, better not be so involved in the business of this world that your heart has ignored and you are neglecting your great salvation because it won't be long now. We're going to be gone out of this place. Somebody say amen. See, there's never the tribulation that begins with the seals. Yes, it begins with the seals, the seven seals. Rich men, powerful men, great men all look up and say, somebody deliver us. This is the beginning of the tribulation. Deliver us from him, from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb because the day of his great wrath has come upon us. That's at the very beginning. There's never been a time like the tribulation is going to be. Jesus said, since the beginning of the world, nothing like this has happened. And when it's over, it will never happen again. There will never be a greater time of horror than when the tribulation comes. Some people say, well, what about the flood? Listen, God let the flood take care of the sinners then. 
But in the tribulation, God's going to take care of them himself. He says, God is going to himself tread out, tread out the winepress of his wrath. God's not going to send a flood. He himself is going to come and judge those who have rejected the truth, who do not love his son, who have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have totally said, we don't want you. And God said, I will take care of you myself. The tribulation is for sinners and the Jewish nation to be revived. I hear people say things like this. Well, some of the church will go through the tribulation. I'm going to ask you a question again because it's on my mind. If the church is the body of Christ, why is the body of Christ suffering the wrath of God? That means Jesus is suffering his wrath again. Wrong. Not one believer will be on this, left on this earth when Jesus comes back. Not one. If any part of the body of Christ is on this earth during the tribulation, remember this. Paul said, we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. When one rejoices, all rejoice. When one weeps, all weep. So you're going to tell me that Christians during the wrath of God, during the tribulation, weeping and crying and hurting will not affect those who are already in heaven? Will there be weeping in heaven? Oh, no. Wrong again, sir. The tribulation is for God himself to judge sinners who have rejected his son. We are the body of Christ. We're the righteousness of God. And millions of Christians are already in heaven. Millions. Why would the last generation be the only one to suffer the tribulation. And here's what somebody else would say. But the Bible says we're all going to suffer tribulation. No, uh, you got to understand something. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Those that are righteous in Christ will suffer tribulation. But that's not the tribulation I'm talking about. That tribulation is the everyday fight with the battle, uh, the battle with the flesh and the devil that we have to go through. There have been hundreds, millions of martyrs that had to go through a tribulation. But that's not the tribulation I'm talking about. The last seven years are not about being tested by the devil. This is the wrath of God being poured out. It's unprecedented. This is the ire of the Almighty being unleashed in full force. And I am telling you who are listening, who are watching, you do not want to take a chance and fall under the wrath of Almighty God. Don't neglect salvation. Don't turn away. Don't be ignorant. Don't be foolish. I read Paul's writings in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 3. Do I sound like a preacher this morning? I ought to. I am one. 1 Thessalonians. Help me find it. Put it on the screen if you would, please. I can't find it. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren... You have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. You understand that? You, but, but pastor, he's talking about the second coming. Not so. You see, I can tell you when the second coming is going to take place. Ready? It will take place 1,260 days, 42 months, or three and a half years after... Antichrist enters the temple and declares himself to be God. Exactly from that day, 1,260 days later, Jesus Christ will split the clouds on a white horse and 10,000s times 10,000s of us saints who went in the rapture will come back with him. Hey, but he's not, that's not a thief in the night because that can be predicted. That's not a thief in the night because signs of the times will be everywhere. He's talking about a thief in the night to us who are alive right now. You know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And look at it. They shall 
not escape. But I plan to escape all of this. I don't plan to give my angels a hard time trying to jerk my hands off things, off situations. I'm in Sodom and I'm ready to get out of it. If the Spirit of God is saying, let's go now, I'm ready to go now. I got no reason to stay anymore. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Hallelujah to God. I want to read something to you. Luke 21. Jesus said, but take heed to yourselves. Talking to me. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with, a, with carousing. You know, we got people in this church that do that every weekend. They're sitting up on bar stools in the weekend, just drinking and talking foolishness, a bunch of sports crap, gambling. You're not saved, sir. If that's why you get up on Friday to go to work so you can have one of those weekends, you're not saved. A child of God runs from that stuff. A child of God loves Scripture. A child of God wants Jesus. A child of God will come out from among the world. You won't do the things the world is doing. And this church is full of people like that. Not this morning. Those people are sitting at home still asleep or they just turned it on with a cup of coffee and they don't even know what's going on. And the cares of this life, the cares of this, Jesus said, be careful. Take heed to yourselves so that the cares of this life will not bog you down and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a trap, on a, as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Here it is. Watch, therefore. Watch. Watch. Listen to me. Watch. Watch! I know I'm yelling. I understand why I'm yelling, though. This is the passion of God inside of me. I'm responsible for souls. Watch! And pray always, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. You know what my job is every day when I get up? Watch and pray. Refuse to be bogged down. Refuse to carouse. Refuse to let my body or my mind get drunk on anything but the Holy Spirit. When I get up every day, I'm supposed to say, this could be the day. This could be my last day on earth. This could be the day I step into eternity. I don't have a promise of Tuesday. I don't have a promise of six hours from now. This could be the day. Watch so that you may be able to escape. Watch and pray that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And this is how I want to end. I want them to take me to Matthew 22. I never saw this till yesterday. Jesus spoke a parable and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son and sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. That's why I yell. That's why I'm screaming, and that's why I don't care what you think about my yelling and screaming. Because I'm preaching to people who have been invited, and they are not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. Listen but they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his business. 
and the rest seized his servants, meaning his prophets, his preachers, treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. He sent out his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Do not tell me God's not going to get angry. Don't tell me he's not now angry. The Bible I read says he's angry with the sinner every day. The Bible I'm preaching from says if you're not saved, you're the enemy of God. You cannot tell me that God is sitting up there wiping his nose and crying because nobody seems to care. He is, if he has one, he's looking at his watch and he's counting it down. Jesus doesn't even know the day or the hour, he said. I see Jesus at the Father's right hand staring dead at the face of the Father. As the Father does this, Jesus is staring because Jesus is so anxious to come Stand on the clouds, call with a loud voice, and grab us up and take us to be with him forever. But they made light of it. Just like some people are doing right now as they're listening to this CD. Just as some people are doing as they're sipping their coffee. Right, making light of it. Like I'm going way overboard. Like I'm making this too serious. Like no wonder people don't want to go to church because of that kind of preaching. Well, let me tell you why people don't want to go to church. Because they're unbelievers. Because they're unbelievers. It's got nothing to do with the way we're decorated or the way the pews are arranged or having a cross on the back wall or looking very traditional. That isn't why sinners don't go to church. They don't go to church because they don't love the Lord. They don't go to church because they're lost in their sins. They're unbelievers. Now, if you want unbelievers to come in, fix the building up where unbelievers feel comfortable. Preach a message that makes unbelievers feel comfortable. Sing songs that make sinners feel good. You can fill up a building, but it's filled with sinners. You don't need to clap. Here's what I noticed, boy. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law. This is after the angel said, get your family and get out of this place. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law who had married his daughters and said, get up, get out of this place for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. And that's who's going to be left behind. And as soon as Lot and his two daughters and his wife, who by the way, was still so connected to Sodom that she just had to turn around and look one more time. Everything she had was there. And God said, I told you not to look. I told you not to be that connected to that wicked, vile place. May I ask this church, are you still so connected that if you were to leave today, you'd just want to take one last look? One last look at the ranch. One last look at the farm. One last look at the house, the car. One last look at all you've done. Or would you say, trash, going to burn up. Even so, come, I'm ready to go. I'm preaching good here this morning. They thought he was joking. Stand with me, please. You don't think I'm joking, do you? you? You don't think I'm joking, do you? I'm telling you, in an hour that you think not, the Son of Man is coming back for His church. The question is, are you ready? I will stand here today in front of all of you and say, there is nothing between me and my Savior. I'm hiding nothing. I'm not carrying anything. I've confessed and I'm clean and I'm ready to go. Can I get an amen from anybody else? You can have my guns. In fact, I've gotten rid of most of them. 
You can get, I, I don't want to go down a list now. You can have it all. I said you can have it. I don't need it. What I want is more of Him. So Father, I pray this morning that your word was heard. I pray that your people will be built up. And I pray for sinners never to think I'm joking about this. Lord, don't let anybody make light of this. This is the most wonderful thing they'll hear all day long. And I pray that Holy Spirit be strong and mighty as you convict and bring them to the knowledge of Jesus and the realization that we're about to leave this place. I'm going to do it anyway. I just feel like doing it. If there's anybody here this morning that is not sure, not sure that if you were to drop dead now or the trumpet would sound, you would go to heaven. You can come down here and we'll pray with you. And you can leave knowing you're ready to go. Don't neglect this great salvation. Please don't ignore this. Don't put it off. You don't know how long you have to put it off. So as we stand here, it's kind of frozen right now, kind of uneasy. People don't really know what to do. I'm going to tell you what to do. If you're saved and know it, you ought to thank God. You ought to lift a hand and thank Him that you are rapture ready right now. Hallelujah! Sing it, David. meeting tomorrow night that is unless the Lord comes if you exit through those extreme doors there we'll thank you let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight O Lord my strength and my redeemer amen God be with you till we meet again somewhere